Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Penyan Assembly of God. I'm Pastor Russell Labar. This week, I decided to come to you from my little cave here, uh, just kind of my little recording studio that uh, I set up for the weekday live stream and just kind of thought that, hey, maybe I'd mix it up a little bit for uh, today for this sermon and everything, just for the fun of it, really. So, uh, I hope that you all are doing well. I hope that uh, everybody is is not going to stir crazy with everything. And I'm just uh, so glad to be able to come to you in this way over, uh, over the technology that we have in place in this era. And, and it's just, it's such a blessing to be able to, to have this available for us. So, uh, all right, well, hey, I uh, just really want to kind of get right into it, get right to the sermon this morning and get into the word. Uh, it's just a wonderful time of, uh, of worship with John. I'm so thankful for everything that everybody's doing, that everybody that's throwing in. I want to, you know, here we are on Memorial Day weekend, right? Um, and it's, it's a time when we, we honor those primarily that have, uh, that have, bled and, and died and sacrificed for our freedom that have fallen and and served our country as far back as the civil war when uh, the, the first um, memorial day really took place when the the freed slaves had this memorial day to honor all of the soldiers who had fallen and fought to win their freedom so uh, so it's really I think, um, an incredible time for for us to to remember uh, all those who have gone before us. So I also want to just thank uh, John and Schweitzer, Gabriel Schweitzer, for the times that they've led. And I want to thank um, Zeke, uh, Ezekiel Smoker, for, for preaching, uh, and Dave Capone for preaching, and Jared Bryan for preaching, and also everything that Jared is doing with the live stream is just uh, phenomenal. All the work that he's put into this and has been putting into this for uh, quite some time now. Uh, I mean, it's been, you know, years that we've been doing this before we actually got into the live streaming and the pre-recording of, of messages back when Pastor John was pastoring here. Um, and really uh, getting ahead of the game. So it's really been a blessing that we haven't had to um, to really switch gears too badly during this whole thing. So I'm just really thankful for them. I'm really thankful for everybody uh, that's that's tuning in, everybody that's continuing to give. Um, your your faithful gifts make all this possible. Really, that's uh, it's it's the way that we stay afloat, just to let you guys know, because of faithful giving, we've been able to make our mortgage payments. All the bills are paid. Um, and uh, that's just, that's a wonderful thing. I'm grateful to God for that. So I just wanted to take that moment to just honor those people. And if you, uh, if you're thinking about it, let them know just how appreciative you are of everything that they're doing. Cause you know what, they're, they're not laying down their lives in the way of, um, of you know, actual death or, or blood, but uh, they are absolutely sacrificing. They are laying down their time and energy because of the passion and call that they have to to serve all of you in in the various ways of ministry. And actually, after the service today, uh, Jared's going to be sharing a little bit of a tidbit for. Um, for those of you out there that have really been blessed by this live stream ministry, uh, whether it be, um, you know, just over this time or you are a regular live stream uh, attendee. Uh, so we want to continue to improve our ability to do this and do this well, because this isn't something that we're just we're doing to bide us time until we're back together in full swing. Like we're going to keep doing the live stream. We're going to keep doing this because we believe it's important because if we can reach just one person, just one person with the gospel of Jesus Christ, if one person comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through these live streams, it's worth it. What amount of money can we place on a soul, right? So that's something where 
uh, that's really a driving force for us as we as we look to do things, especially with this live stream thing. We've seen where there are people that have gotten this uh, that um, that don't darken the doors of churches that maybe never will. And that's okay. There's no judgment there. There's no condemnation there. I get that. But that doesn't mean they can't um, come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. That doesn't mean that they can't um, they can't walk with him and grow with him. So really everything we're doing here, we're doing for the one. You know, we're doing it for the one who saved us, and we're also doing it for the one that he died for. You know, so maybe this morning you're that one and you're wondering, you're on the fence, you're not sure about this whole Jesus thing. Hang in there. Keep watching. Keep tuning in. And uh, I believe that if the Spirit's drawing you, you will find a, a, a rich and a vibrant life in Him. So, all right. Well, with that, other announcements. There's really not any at this point. Uh, here in Yates County, we are in Phase 1 reopening. Uh, as far as things go, you know, a number of business and people have gone back to work. So we're just kind of, you know, we're taking things in stride. And uh, I'm hoping, man, am I hoping that things can be uh, open enough by church picnic. Like, because, I mean, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm just, I'm looking forward to that kind of fun fellowship. The weather's warmer, it's nicer, and, and all that. Um, in regards to the shoe distribution, everything's on hold with that. You know, really, we're all, we've all experienced frustration and, and upset and uh, disruption in our lives through this. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the calendar events that were on the calendar have had to be cleared. So, um Aside from that, just want to let you all know that, that we love you. And uh, before I get into the word here, I just want to take a moment and, uh, and pray and submit myself, my heart, my life to God and commit all of you to him. So, Father, I just pray, God, that in this time, as we come together virtually, as we come together um, to hear your word spoken, God, that you would, Father, speak what you want to speak. God, that you would let my thoughts, my words, my heart be yours. God, that you would just, you would anoint my lips to speak what you want me to speak. You would anoint my heart to speak uh, you know, to, to receive as well what you're speaking to me in the moment. God, make me soft and pliable. Help me to speak with, with boldness and authority. Help me to speak and, and, and preach in a prophetic nature. To build up the people, your people, your church. They're not mine, they're yours. So God, I commit them to you. And ask God that you would do the work in them that only you can do. I just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, this morning uh, I felt like the Lord kind of led me to a new uh, new book. So we're going to be looking at the book of Haggai. Uh, that's kind of where we're going, just to let you know. Uh, it's something that's been on my heart for a couple weeks now, and I've just been meditating on it, and you know, just to kind of set the stage for that uh, and really give us an idea where we're, we're going with this. Aren't we ready to get back at it? That's the title of this morning's sermon, is get, get, getting back at it. You know, we're ready to get back at it. Well, what is it? Everything. We're ready to get back to life as, as usual, maybe not quite as usual. Are we ready to get back at it? You know? Um, school's going to be out for the summer. Churches are kind of navigating this new water. Um, and, and there's a lot of things where, you know, I've been shying away from the, the sermon title that Dave used a couple of weeks ago, the new normal, because this ain't normal. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know what, we're all anxious to get back at it. We're ready to get, get back at getting together and, and fellowshipping with one another worshiping together, praying together, breaking bread and eating meals together. 
we're ready to get back at it, aren't we? And, you know, we're ready to get back at, at what God wants us to be doing, I believe. So, looking at Haggai. First, before I really get into the scripture portion of that, I'm just going to kind of give a little bit of a historical background of what was going on in Haggai. Um, and actually, it's Haggai, um, like hey, guy. That's how you pronounce it, apparently, in the Hebrew. Hey, guy. Um, historical setting. It is the year 520 B.C. For those of you who... Um, are confused about the BC and the AD thing and how time works. In BC, the numbers count backwards, basically up through. So uh, in 538, 18 years earlier, uh, the exiles uh, were returning to Jerusalem. Back it up even further than that. The nation of Israel, who had been delivered from Egypt and had gone through many kings, some good, some evil, uh, they had gone, they had divided into two kingdoms. There was the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. And, um, you know, the, the Israel went with the Assyrians and Judah went to with the Babylonians and King Nebuchadnezzar. And, and it was one of those things where they got exiled. It was a punishment because they had given themselves over to idolatry. And so God chose to punish them by exiling them from their land. Their temple was destroyed. Uh, everything was ransacked. Their their People were carried out to this foreign land where idolatry, that thing that they chose over God, was so rampant. It was kind of like when you eat too much sugar, right? You just, they had so much idolatry then they were sick to their stomachs with it. Um, but in the year 538, the Lord started sending them back to their land, to Jerusalem to start rebuilding. So under King Cyrus, the, the people of Judah were sent back with a specific mission to rebuild the temple, the community and practices of worship. So, so they were being sent back. They were commissioned by King Cyrus who, so the Babylonian Empire had fallen to the Persian Empire, and King Cyrus was the, the king at the time, and, and he commissioned them to go back, go, rebuild the temple, start temple worship, rebuild everything. And this land that had once been fully theirs, they had had national sovereignty and all of that, was now split up, and it was being governed by these different, you know, vassal lords and all of that stuff. And so they were being, they were sent back. So after they were sent back, for two years, they worked to rebuild their community and their way of life. They, they were clearing away rubble. They were building homes. They were setting up the altar. They were celebrating the feasts. They were offering sacrifices. And they started to lay the foundation for the rebuilding of the temple. So let's go to Haggai and see what's going on. Um, and we actually, we find that uh, in Ezra, actually Ezra chapter 1 through 3 gives the account of what was going on and kind of how that, that all the things that they were doing that I mentioned and, and um, cleaning away the rubble, building homes and, and doing all that. And then in Ezra chapter 4, what we find is that, that trouble came, opposition came. Disruption came, frustration came. Um, so they had this opposition to rebuilding the temple combined with the task of rebuilding their homes and lives. It caused them to get off mission. The building of the temple took a back seat for the next 16 years. But then in 520 BC, Haggai receives a prophetic word from the Lord to get them back at it. So, there we go. Why don't we go to Haggai? Turn with me if you can. If you're using your phone, you might already be there. But uh, I'm going the old-fashioned paper way because I just like it. So I'm going to be reading from the NIV today. 
starting in Haggai chapter 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to jo Joshua, son of Jozdak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. So as they had settled away from the, the urgency, the priority, the mission of getting that temple built, the very thing that they were sent there by King Cyrus to do, because the opposition came, the disruption came, and all those things came, they got off target. They got off mission. They had gotten um, comfortable with saying, it's, it's not time yet. Time's not right yet. We're just not there yet. Right? So that's what God's saying. These people are saying the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expect much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains in ruin. Well, each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I call for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedach, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the 16th month. So here we have this, uh, this rebuilding, this mission that they were sent on, that that they had been commissioned to do 18 years earlier, sent by King Cyrus, not just sent like, go build it from nothing, but he said, I'm going to send you with the full blessing of the kingdom. I'm going to provide the gold. I'm going to provide the silver. I'm going to provide the, the, the means for you to rebuild that temple. But then again, opposition came. So just a couple questions to ask uh, as we get into this. Why was rebuilding the temple so important? Why was it so important to them as a people? That's the first area. Why was it important to them as a people, as a nation? Well, it was had everything to do with their history. Right? That was like a link to their history. It wasn't just like the physical land. The temple was a, a significant part, a memorial, if you will, to their history because it was a, it was a symbol of, uh, a, of God dwelling with them and, and what their ancestors ex had experienced when the presence of God came down on the first temple and, and the priest fell face down and under the power of the presence of God. You know, so it, it was tied to their history. It was tied to their identity. Everything else had been stripped away. They had been taken out of their land. Everything laid in shambles. The, they had been literally stripped down to nothing and been in captivity for 70 years before they started coming back. So it was important because it had to do with their history. 
It had to do with their identity. It had to do with the presence of God. The NIV Cultural Background Study Bible says, the temple was to serve as the center point to give the former exiles a new way of understanding themselves in a changed world. Everything was different. Everything was different for them, but they needed that center point. That center point is an anchor, right? To, to say, this is who we are. This is what we are about. This is why we are here, right? This is our mission. This is our purpose, and this is our place. And God is, is telling them, it's time to get back at it, right? It's an important thing, this rebuilding of the temple. Why is it important to God, though? Well, to God, it was an act of commitment and obedience, right? Them doing that. He had given them the tools. He had given them the commission. He had given them the blessing of the government, even. And it was an act of commitment and obedience because it was to be a place of reverent worship, a place of sacrifice, a place of service, a place of restoration, a place for the presence of God to be experienced, a place that prophecy would be fulfilled, which we'll be getting into that next week. In regards to restoration, because really I believe that's what we're all we're all wanting. That's what we're all looking for and getting back at it, right? We 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 want to get back at it. We want to have what um, what we've experienced those sweet times together in, in worship, those sweet times together in the Word, those sweet times together in fellowship. We want the restoration of that, right? We want to see godliness restored. We want to see righteousness restored. We want to see justice in opposition to injustice restored. Again, from the NIV Cultural Background Study Bible in regards to restoration, it says that spiritual restoration must precede social or political restoration. That's why the temple was so important because that was that center point, that anchor point. And that spiritual restoration had to precede the social and political restoration. So before God could bring about the things that he wanted to bring about socially, politically, first he had to bring about what he needed to bring about spiritually. It says that God's presence is the key to restoration. How many people know that, man? How many people, you know that to be true, that when God's presence comes into the room, something changes. The atmosphere changes. Your heart changes. Those hard places become soft. Sometimes we weep. Sometimes we laugh. Sometimes we rejoice when his presence comes in the room. That's why rebuilding the temple was so important. Why getting back at it was so important. So why don't we take a jump now? Because we got to recognize some things, right? Uh, the, the cultural context of this book, it's, it's <coughs> regarding the exiles. It's regarding the Hebrews. And most of us are Gentiles. This really has nothing to do with us. It wasn't um, addressed to us. We weren't there. Um, so we got to kind of make that jump. We got to kind of um, take a look at what does this mean for us as New Testament believers, right? Because this is even, this is pre, pre-Jesus. So what does this have to do? With regards to us. Well, first, uh, as we look at this New Testament understanding of, of the temple, let's define what the temple is not in a New Testament sense. The New Testament is not a singular building. 
in John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. When Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, he said some pretty profound things in regards to the temple and even the temple in that day. So the temple that these people went on to build, right, that Haggai was was talking to, they went on to build that temple. And as history went on over the next few hundred years, that temple got built up and it got uh, got redone and improved. So it eventually became the temple that Jesus walked in and worshiped in and, and came to and, and and it was something that was necessary for, like I said, the, the fulfillment of scripture, the fulfillment of prophecy. It was significant still in Jesus' day. But Jesus goes to tell about a time coming even still. So, starting in verse 19 of John chapter 4. The woman, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, the time is coming when we will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was always the place where the temple was to be. So Jesus is saying a time is coming when we will worship the Father neither on this mountain where the Samaritans worshipped nor in Jerusalem where the Hebrews worshipped said, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know this Messiah called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus de declared, I am the one speaking to you. I am he. So Jesus is saying, no longer is it going to be a singular building. It's not going to be a mountain in, in Samaria. It's not going to be a temple in Jerusalem. It's going to be something else. What else? is the temple not that it was back then, just for to get this whole New Testament understanding. Well, in Hebrews chapter 10, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, I'm not even going to read any of it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of scripture that I'm going to reference today that uh, we're not going to necessarily go to, uh, but Hebrews chapter 10, just the overall heading for Hebrews chapter 10 is Christ's sacrifice once and for all. So one thing that the, the New Testament temple is not is a place of animal sacrifice and holding with the practices of Judaism. See, Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that that, that has been a done away with because, because Jesus provided that blood sacrifice once and for all. There's no more need for any blood sacrifices in order to pay the penalty for the sins of mankind because Jesus did it. It's what it is. It's done. It's finished. He did it all. No more needs to be done. So in regards to that, Hebrews chapter 10, those are two things. It's not, it's not one single place. And it's not a place where we do animal sacrifices and the things that they used to do in the temple, right? Now let's look at what the temple is in the New Testament sense. So back in John chapter 14, Jesus tells us what this new temple is going to look like. Like I said, there's a lot of scripture in regards to this. I'm only going to reference some of it. I'm only going to read some of it. I'll let you know what the references are to the other ones. But John chapter 14, starting in verse 15 and going through verse 24, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. 
the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whenever, whoever has my command and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So there in verse 23, see, the temple was the place where the presence of Almighty God dwelled. It was, it was apparent in the Holy of Holies. It was a big deal. Jesus is saying that those who obey me, those who, who follow me, those who place their faith in me, who, who love me and show their love for me by, by obedience to the teachings that I have laid out, I and the Father will come to them by the Spirit. We will make our abode in the person. In the person. So then the person becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. In John 17, 20 through 24, Jesus again prays for the believers and talks about that oneness, talks about that presence of God dwelling in the believers and the believers dwelling in God and kind of that, that, um, that mystical union that takes place when we be when we become believers and, and get saved and, and, and begin to walk with God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says it this way. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit is, dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. So in this instance, God is saying um, that regarding that it's not just the individual, right? In John 14, he's saying the one, right? The one that obeys, the one that keeps, the one that loves, that person is the temple of the Almighty God. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, well, all right, then John 17, he talks about how there's all of us together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 here, he's saying, you together are that temple. So there's, then it brings it into that whole unity, that whole piece, this us as the church, as a whole. We are that temple, right, in the plural sense. But then we go ahead and to 1 Corinthians a little further, to chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. Paul writes, Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins that a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So back to that singular. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So far, we're seeing a very resounding um, theme that, that we, we have become the temple. No longer is it is it stones one stacked on the other with you know timbers that the act is supporting braces, but rather we have become the temple. We as individuals and we corporately have become the temple of Almighty God. Another one that talks about all believers is in Ephesians chapter two, verses nineteen through twenty-two. We're not. I'm not going to read that one. Uh, you can write that down. 
read that on your own time. Uh, and then the next one, though, that I am going to read is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. We're going to be talking about this whole concept that Peter's talking about in, in the weeks going forward, weeks and perhaps even months. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, You also, actually, let me back it up to verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, talking about Jesus, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. What is a spiritual house? It's a temple. To be a holy priesthood, offering, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. So we are... We are those living stones. We are being built together. We are the temple of the living God. But not only are we the temple of the living God, we are both the temple and we are the priesthood. We are a kingdom of priests. And I think for a long time, there's, there's been this idea that, that the pastor and the leadership in the church, right, that, that they are kind of the priests of our day and that they are the ones that are responsible for the building and the this and the that and the everything else. But the reality is that we are a kingdom of priests, Scripture says. So we are not only the temple, but we are the priests. We are the ones that are responsible. Each and every one of us are responsible for whatever service, whatever purpose it is that God has placed us in the body for. Each and every one of us. The pastor is not any more important than, than the person that is, is doing a lesser job. We all have our place. We all have our part to play in this temple. Right? We all have our place. We all have our mission. We all have a purpose. Because we're the temple. And we're the priesthood. And it takes all of us together. All of us together. So then, what is our mission? You know, we as, as churches, uh, we spend a lot of time, I believe, and in, in we have in the past. and uh, Churches still do, and I think it's important uh, to an extent to to really articulate what our mission is. What it is, our unique mission as churches. Um, as organizations, as like this body here with this DNA. What is our mission? Well, what is our mission universal? What is the mission universal that, that should take no work whatsoever on our part? What is the mission that we have been given by the king? Right? What is that? And if you said it's the great commission, you're right. That can be found in uh, various Gospels, but the one that I'm going to read here this morning is out of Matthew chapter 28 and verse uh, 19. Jesus said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So basically here, Jesus is saying, go and build temples. Follow me here? Go and build temples. Go and make disciples. Because when we are making disciples, what are we doing? We are, we are leading people into a living and an active walk of following Jesus Christ. And when people enter into a living and active walk in following Jesus Christ, what happens? They become a temple. So he's telling us to go and to build temples. The people, the people in whom I will dwell by my spirit says the Lord. How do we do that? How do we build temples? Well, obviously there's, there's conversion. That's, that's the first step. But how do we do that for others? How do we build the temple? Right? Well, for others, uh, the word of God. 
the Word of God. Acts 20, verse 32. It says, Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So, by exposing people to the Word of God, by exposing people to the Word of God, we build them up. By showing them grace and serving one another. In Romans chapter... Oops, I'm going to pass here. Chapter 15 says, we who are strong ought to bear with the fallings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbor for their good to build them up. Right? So how do we build others? We bear with them. We give them grace. We give them encouragement. We can give them words of encouragement. That's another way we build people up, by, by speaking words of encouragement to them. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Right? That it may benefit those who listen. So that is how we do that. We do, don't let unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but consider what you're speaking. Consider what you're saying and how you, are you building. Do your words build? Do you, are you building the temple of God with your words? Are you encouraging? 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just in fact, you are doing. I know that that's happening. I know that you're encouraging one another. I've seen it. I've heard it. So that's something oops, where uh, that is to your credit. If you're doing these things, that's to your credit. How about the exercise of spiritual gifts? I mean, we have the entirety of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that talks about the purpose of the gifts is to build up the body of Christ. And it talks about the diversities of the gifts and how diversity is something that is to be celebrated. And that diversity is something that we are to, to celebrate, yet at the same time move in unity and love. So we have the entirety of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but we also have 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In verse 2, it says, you know, the exercise of spiritual gifts. So how do we build each other up? With the exercise of spiritual gifts, right? Verse 2. Oops, sorry. 14 verse 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They understand mysteries in the spirit, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. And in verse 12, it says, uh, so that was kind of a comparison saying, listen, tongues doesn't necessarily build up other people unless there's an interpretation that's later in the chapter, but, but tongues builds up the individual. Prophecy, on the other hand, prophecy is something that builds everybody up. And in verse 12, it says, so, is it, so it is with you, since you're eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to, an excel, try to excel in those that build up the church. So that's how we build others up. That's how we build other temples, through the gifts, through encouragement, through grace, through speaking the word, you know, um, encouraging people to get in the word, and exposing them to it, that's how we build the temple. For ourselves, again, back to the exercise of spiritual gifts, the speaking in tongues in particular. We have, you know, how um, Paul says, I would like everyone to speak in tongues. I'd rather that you prophesied. So the one who prophesies, yeah, sorry. Yeah, verse 4, 14, 4. 
1 Corinthians, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, builds themselves up, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. So, so there's, that's how we, we build ourselves up. When we, if you have the gift of tongues, you're, you've been given that prayer language that you exercise in your prayer closet, that builds you up in your spirit. And in fact, you speak mysteries in the spirit. And you might never know what it is you speak, but you know that you've been built up. And God builds us up that way. And then if we go way to the back here, it talks about it again in the, the book of Jude. That little one chapter book in verse 20. Jude wrote, But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, praying in the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily uh, mean it's only tongues, right? Praying in the Holy Spirit is praying spirit-led prayers, where the Spirit is leading you to pray things that maybe weren't even on your radar. So, but there is a an aspect of praying builds us up. Praying builds us up, so we build our own temple, our temple of the Holy Ghost through prayer, through reading the word, through being encouraged. So placing yourself where you're receiving solid teaching from the word of God, that's another, another way to build up your temple. So getting back at it, getting back at it. We have our mission right? Go and make disciples. Go and build temples. We are the place, right? We are the place where the Spirit of God dwells. And we live with a purpose. Each and one of us has a purpose. And His purpose is our priority, or should be our priority. So let's get back at it and, and go back to Haggai for the closing thoughts, the closing challenge. I hope that, that you are as challenged and you allow yourself to be as challenged as I've been as I've been reading this. Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. When the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, it is, is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses? Well, this house remains a ruin. There in verse 2, we go back to that. The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Is revival something that you consider to be off in the distance? That, that it's not yet time for revival. Things aren't just quite right for revival to happen. Revival is something, you know, we need, we need this, we need that, we need this, this element. Everything's got to be in place for revival to happen. If that is something that you continually find yourself making excuses why revival's not coming, you know, do you say... Do you say in your own heart for your own personal life, it's not, the time has not yet come. Maybe once I do this, consider your ways, right? Consider your ways. That's what the Bible says here. Give careful thought to your ways in verse 5. And verse 7, he says, the, the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. Consider. Give careful thought to your ways. Does comfort take priority in your temple? Or is it the continued building? Is that of highest importance? Are you willing to endure are you willing to endure discomfort in order to build up this temple you've been given that you have become? Or is comfort more important to you? The Lord says, consider your ways. 
Does it seem like the harder you work, the behinder you get? I mean, this is what the Lord said to them. You've planted much, you've harvested little, you eat, you never have enough. You drink, you never have your fill. You put on clothes, you're, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says in verse 7. Give careful thought to your ways. Consider your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber to build my house. Mountains are places of solitude. Go into the mountains in prayer with the Lord. Go into the, the prayer closet and build up the temple, right? So that he may pay, take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. So does it seem like the harder you work, the harder you're going at things, the behinder you get, you just can't seem to get anywhere? Consider your ways. Spend more time on his agenda than you do on your own. Or a little more on his and take away from spending time on your own. I remember in my own life a time when this was true. It was a time when the Lord had uh, challenged me. I was a partner in a commercial roofing business, uh, working a lot of hours, and the Lord challenged me to, to start working on this building that we meet in here. A building that once upon a time, I was against building, uh, that I didn't have a vision for. I didn't like how it was, was going about. So we left the church for two years. We came back, and in God's amazing and awesome sense of irony, he told me he wanted me to give my Fridays to the building project here. So talked it over with the partners, and I sacrificed a day of work and came and worked on the church building. One day when I was working on the church building, I was praying and I asked God, I said, God, I got all of this stuff at my house, all of these projects that are there, they're undone, it's horrible, I just feel horrible about them. I, I, I wanna get this done and that done and, and it's just, I would really like to, you know, maybe we could be a little more comfortable with the house with the amount of people that we have in our family and the size of our house. If God, if I could just spend some time on that. And he spoke something to me. I'll never forget it. He said, you worry about building my house. And I'll worry about building yours. When the Lord says, you worry about building my house. And I'll worry about building yours. At that point, being a pastor was not on my radar. I guess that's as close as you get to a burning bush sometimes but I was a little dense and I didn't quite get it, but I said, okay, I'll wait and see what you have, what that actually means. But, you know, I had to spend less time on my agenda, more time on his. And all of a sudden, all those things that I had been spending so much time on, so much energy on, all of a sudden, they just started like getting done and it was easy. It went smooth. It's unreal. I wish that that was true all the way through and that all my projects were done. But if anybody that really knows me, they know that just as soon as one project gets done, another one gets started um, or two. Uh, always got something going on. But consider your ways. Have you been building his temple or have you been building your own? How do we respond? What do we do? What did they do? Well, Haggai, verses 12 through 15, it said, Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joseph, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Well, the whole remnant of the people obeyed God and they got back at it. In verse 13, it talk, on it talks about how the Spirit stirred them. It stirred the leaders. It stirred 
It stirred Zerubbabel, the governor of the area. It stirred Joshua, the, the high priest. It stirred the entire remnant. It stirred them up to do the good work of building the temple. And things started progressing. Things started moving. You see, frustration, opposition, disruption, they're no match for the Spirit of God. Moving to build His temple. Are we ready to get back at it? Because it's far too late in the game here. Zeke and, and, and Dave both preached out a revelation. I'm not uh, a huge eschatology study of the end times guy. I have been in the past. Uh, I know enough to be dangerous probably, um, mainly because, uh, you know, there's, there's just, there's too much going on right now to deny that we're closer now than we've ever been. The signs of the times are ramping up at breakneck speed. It is far, far too late in the game to play church any longer. There's too much at stake. There's too much at stake and the time is short. There are too many souls, too many people, people within the church that, that, that are weak and worn out because if not been building themselves and not been being built by others. There are too many people out there that have they've never had the opportunity to become a temple that need the hope of restoration, the hope of purpose, the hope of mission, the hope of place, the hope of experience in the presence of Almighty God. It's time to get back at it. As a royal priesthood, of temple builders, we must get back at it. We must. It's too late in the game. So let's get building, shall we? Father, I just thank you, God, that you've given us your spirit, that you have given us the awesome privilege of housing the presence of Almighty God within ourselves, that we as individuals can experience that, that we corporately as a body can experience that. Father, I ask that you would forgive us, God. Forgive us for placing comfort over mission, over purpose, over place. Help us to get back at it. Give us the strength. Give us the resolve. God, give us the insight and help us to, to consider our ways so that we can actually do what you've called us to do and experience the blessing of being stirred by your spirit. God, we want that. We want to be built up in you, to live as a priesthood and as a temple in you. I just thank you, God, for all of your mighty ways. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone. Have a blessed rest of the day. I pray that... Uh, you enjoy the rest of this Memorial Day weekend. Make some memories with your family and remember what it costs to give you the freedom that you have. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. All right, God bless you all. Farewell. Hey everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is normally the time we would do a closing song through YouTube, and we would remind you guys you can check out the messages on YouTube. Uh, don't forget about that. Those The message from today will still be there uh, and available to you. But we are going a little bit of a different round today just because we have a video that I've made up. Uh, it's kind of about the future of you know where we're going because of COVID-19 and specifically about the future of the live stream. So what better place for it than at the end of the live stream? 
So please stick around for that, check it out, and then if you can't, it will be on our Facebook, it will be on our YouTube. But if you can carve away like five to ten minutes, check this out. That would mean a lot. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Well, everybody, COVID-19. Am I right? It's been a trip. I know it's not over yet, but I think we're finally starting to like see the light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, things are starting to shift into place where we can start moving towards getting back into our church building. And that's exciting. But as we go through this, we don't want this just to be a uh, page in our book. You know, we want something to, we want to take something away from this. And I think one of the things that I saw is the growth of the media side of our church. I think we saw value in media that we never saw before. Or at least maybe we felt like our church just wasn't capable or wasn't a need for our church because we are such a rural church. Little town of Penyan. <laughs> maybe we just didn't think we needed it. But it's amazing how much you realize you need something when it's when you're forced into circumstances that make it so you need those things. And that's kind of where we are. Most other churches, we're not the only ones. Many churches just going online because it's the only way they can meet. Being as social as they could while social distancing. Well, I think if anything, we've seen the value of this live stream. And maybe it gave us a glimpse of what it's like to be someone who's lost and finds a church, finds a live stream. You know, sees the hope on the screen, sitting in their pajamas on a couch, gets to hear the gospel through their tablet or phone or laptop, smart TV, whatever it might have been. You know, those those little glimpses, I think, are, are going to help us to make decisions that will increase the way we reach our community and beyond that. So, in talking with our pastor, we've really come to the conclusion that there's a whole ministry that we have not tapped into the, to the best of our ability yet, and that is social media. Whether it be YouTube recordings, live streams on Facebook, uh, small media messages throughout the week, whatever it may be, uh, that's an area that our culture right now drives by a lot. We're a media-driven culture. And we don't want to create an atmosphere where um, all it is is media. We want, at the core of all of that media, it to all come back to the kind of church that we are that worships God. We want all of it to point back to God and glorify God. But at the same time, are we really doing our best right now? See, Russell and I talked a lot. We have come to this place where, as far as these media things go, we want to be professionally authentic. But what does that mean? We want to be as professional as we can with all the areas of these media outreaches, but still be the authentic Penny and Assembly God that we are. The authentic believers that we are. And it's going to take all of us working together, choosing to see this as a ministry that's needed and not just a side project that the church is doing. It's going to take all of us working together, praying together, you know, working on the tech team, financially working together, because the church just cannot do it alone. And it shouldn't have to. And we're the church at the end of the day. And at this point, we're moving back to where people are going to come together. It's going to be a great fellowship. But not everybody's there yet. Not everybody's ready to walk through those doors. So even if it's for one person, if even if it's for the one person, isn't it worth it? So as we move forward, believing that this is what God wants for our church, we're asking that you might come alongside us and help with some of the financial needs. 
help with some of the volunteer needs. If you have technical abilities, please reach out to me. I want to see your gifts being used. I want to know that we can pull you in on the team and your gifts can be used to glorify God and build up this ministry. And then obviously, for everyone, pray. Pray for the ministry. That's huge. Don't think that because it's prayer that it's not enough. The prayer reaches into the spiritual battlefield and accomplishes things we could never do on our own. So please be praying. There's really no cost to going live as far as the software we use and the Facebook lets us do it for free. But there's cost in the equipment. So today I want to outline some of the equipment needs, where we're at with this ministry, what we need to get to that professionally authentic live stream, professionally authentic media. And if you at the end of this have these areas one of these areas all of these areas this entire ministry as it is then definitely reach out to us you can do the paypal link and then just make a note that it's for a specific this specific ministry or specific thing on this list you can also write a check and have it sent to the address that's going to be right here and if you send that you can just make it out to penny and assembly of god okay so, number one on the list, if you've ever been in our live stream, maybe you've heard the audio. It's, 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 a little, it's a little rough around the edges. Well, the first thing we really need to do this professionally is we need to get another digital board. What do I mean by that? Well, right now we have what's called Behringer X32. Ideally, getting another identical board, they would work the best together. There are other versions of this board we can get that are slightly cheaper. But the budget at its core for this board, we would need to get between $1,500 and $2,500 to be able to buy this board to professionally do the audio so that the people that are watching can hear the worship clearly and they can hear each individual person clearly and everything doesn't sound like it's coming through a can. If we really want to get there, that's, that's a need. That's a need when it comes to that equipment. So that's a big one. Another big one is the cameras. Again, if you watch the live stream, you see people are a little blurry. We have two cameras we bounce back and forth between and neither one of them is exactly the same. So they don't put out the same video um, and the quality is different between the two. Well, the best fix to that is to get truly professional video cameras that are made to do this. And after a couple years of shopping around and going through and figuring out exactly what's going to be the best for our church and reading other churches' recommendations and things like that, I think we've, we've gone down to where we can uh, get these new cannons. I think we've finally figured out what we need. And that's really just the Canon G50. These cameras are not cheap. They're also not the most expensive of all the professional cameras out there. So we're looking at about $1,000 a piece. So after taxes, we'll need between $2,000 and $2,500 to get these cameras. And then on top of that, we also need all the cabling. There's various cables. We need HDMI cables, splitters, um, <laughs> different hookups for the mics. There's just various cables we're gonna need as we progress in this. And in order to get all these different things, the mounts for the camera on the back wall, you know, all the various things, we're gonna need about $500 for just the cabling and the little accessories. Now I know we're between five and $6,000 at this point for these things on this list here. But I believe that if this is God's heart, and I believe that it is, that we move forward into this ministry, then he's going to supply it through his people, through his blessings we all could tell stories of how God just made money show up or just made items show up that were in need God fulfills our needs but he also stretches us he also has a step up to the plate in faith that if we give then he's going to shovel it back in you know so if any of these areas come to your mind or if specifically to one of the bigger ones or whatever you want to donate some towards 
then definitely reach out to us. And again, as we move forward in this, I believe God is going to bless you. And at the end of the day, it's not about the numbers. It's not about becoming famous. We don't need to be the next Bethel to reach the one. We can just be Penny and Assembly of God, but we can reach the one. But we also know that as God wants, we can reach more than that. We can go past our town, past our county, past our state, and even past our country and reach beyond the borders in one little live stream. And that's my hope, that if we give it our all, God is going to give it his all, and no one's going to be able to stop it from reaching the lost. Thank you guys for sticking around. Thank you for watching this video. Again, we love you all. Can't wait to see you in person. And we'll catch you guys later. God bless.